guys, welcome to the second part of our evening the, where we're going to have our State of EOS panel discussion where you get to hear from the, the bright lights of EOS and then ask them questions. Uh, but tonight, we, um, here's, I'm going to throw to our, one of our sponsors uh, to talk about their project that's built on um, EOS technology. So welcome Sam Russell from Warbly. Hey guys. Okay. You all hear me? Cool. So, um, how many of you here are familiar with Warbly? Or have heard of us before? Somewhat. Okay, so we've got a few people in here. For those that don't know, Warbly is one of the first sister chains on EOS. So, we're, we're building a whole new, whole new ecosystem. Um, some people call it a side chain, but technically it's a sister chain. It's got its own ecosystem, new governance structure. Um, but our focus is we're a regulated ecosystem and regulated blockchain specifically for financial technology and financial services. What, what that means in, in regards to why aren't we building an app or why aren't we building a sidechain on EOS is we need to have new governance systems, we need to have um, the ability to, to be regulated because financial services are heavily regulated industry globally and if you want to, to borrow money, if you want to lend money, want to get insurance, to do it anonymously, which, you know, blockchain, being decentralized, being anonymous, it's, it's not really, it's, it's not going to work. Big businesses aren't going to adopt it, they're not going to be able to leverage that, and therefore, you know, people won't be able to benefit from what blockchain can enable. You know, Warbly's been going for, for nine months, we started off quite humbly. We were a block producer for EOSIO with, with testnet and mainnet launch, but you know things started escalating. There was a lot of people that kept saying, you know, what Warbly are trying to do by having users identifiable, it's not mandatory. So we are we are implementing KYC AML at the network level. So a user will essentially if you think, you know, everyone in this room, I'm sure you've given your data to a third party, whether you like it or not, to get a service. But the thing is, you've probably given your data to 30 different third parties. What Warbly's striving for, and someone actually wrote about it this week, is with Warbly, you may only need to do KYC once, ever again. Because at the network level, we're, we're going to be validating and verifying users. And those users will have access to, to dApps on the Warbly ecosystem. Leveraging EOSIO code, all the features and benefits, just in a different environment where there's a lot more transparency, financial accountability. And if, if we think about the apps, the industries that we're going to be looking after and, and kind of working with is financial technology, lending, um, insurance, wallets, e commerce, and retail. Think, think about at the moment we, we check out using PayPal. There is an option, and I'm sure there's many other options at the moment where you can check out the different wallets within the within the eco, within maybe EOSIO or within Ethereum. What if you could check out globally on all different websites with Warbly? Maybe you don't need to build the app on Warbly, but you may be able to just utilize our centralized and regulated financial services plugin on your website. So you can pay in cryptocurrency. So you can pay with digital assets. Crypto, imagine buying, like, you know, What's in the news, which annoys me significantly, is is you can't, you won't use Bitcoin to buy a coffee. But hey, if we've got the ability, you may be able to use crypto crypto kitties or you know pixel whatever these pixel you know games are on the network to buy a coffee in the future. And we're just providing an ecosystem to be able to do that. IBC into blockchain communication is something we're striving towards with EOSIO and, and Block One and OCI. Because if we can enable sister chains to work with EOS, this whole ecosystem is going to you know, blossom and there's going to be so much real life use cases that all of us will be able to benefit from in the future. Decentralized, centralized, there's a compromise and that's what, that won't. Um, we're, we're making that compromise to build a bridge and offering an alternative. But also the fundamental philosophy of decentralization is key to us, but that will happen in in the next 18 months over two years. Okay, well thanks Sam. Um, he'll be around uh, for drinks and networking, so he's the man if you want to find 
hear about uh, financial change. Anything finance. Uh, but our next uh, speaker is one of the other sponsor, Generos tonight. Can I hear a round of applause for Ralph? Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sam. It's Mark. Yeah, so we are Team Generous, and you can see, see us in the back here. That's me. I'm head of block producer, and we have a team of five. So we have Nathan here as well, and Ty. Um, two of our other team colleagues couldn't make it tonight because they are traveling. Um, yeah, everyone here is very busy going to um, meetups everywhere around the world, hackathons. We've just been to London. Um, done the Sydney Hackathon as well, and we're excited to see if we can make it to the, to the one in San Francisco as well. But yeah, so we are the leading block producer candidate here in Australia, um, working on the EOS main, mainnet, and we're also very excited to be supporting the Warpley um, startup, so we are, we are ready to go, we are just waiting for it to, to launch uh, in November, so very exciting times. Um, so apart from being, so what does a block producer do? We produce blocks. Um, obviously, we are there is only 21 main nodes uh, on the EOS mainnet. So we are one of the one, one of the 21s because we haven't been quite received the number of votes to get there. So if you have a lot of EOS, um, please vote for us. We are very happy to be producing some blocks on the EOS mainnet. We are ready for that. But at the moment we are uh, a standby and we're moving up and down currently at position um, 45 last time I checked. It keeps changing. Um, apart from that, we use our time to develop on the EOS network. So we've developed, if, if you're transacting on the network, you might have heard about the EOS toolkit. Um, who said about the EOS toolkit? Nice, nice. Who, who has used it? Yeah. Very good, very good. Yeah, so. Who's been on the EOS toolkit in the last uh, 24 hours? <laughs> cool, because we just released a new feature, um, the, the grandpa coin. So you should definitely check it out if you feel like um, some um, looking into the old days and or you feel like mining some BTC or Ethereum. You can now mine that on the EOS mainnet. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Got my technical assistant here, who's um, going to show us, show us the um, the grandpa coin. We can show him later. Yeah. Okay. We um, probably don't have enough time now, but if you're interested in it, come and see us after after the panel. So apart from that, we our main purpose really out there is we want to change how um, charities work, and we want to make them much more transparent. So we're working on a charitable deck at the moment. Um, so stay tuned for that one. We've also developed the um, Pullman token um, in a time when RAM was really expensive. So if you are interested in air grabs or that, uh, that kind of technology, also talk to us. And I guess my time is already up. <laughs> so um, enjoy the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Kevin. Um, so Kevin is uh, the community manager for EOS New York, one of the Hello Top 21 block producers on EOS. Welcome. Woo. Woo. I'm number one right now. Oh, you're number one. Okay. So we're number one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done. So what is your secret? Can you tell us? Uh, <laughs> I've known how to keep it. Now, um, the, uh, there is a tremendous amount of uh, first mover advantage involved, but uh, just the, the what we're doing seems to be resonating, and so we're just going to keep it up. All right, awesome. So it's been about nearly four months since the, the mainnet launch, and um, my question is, do you feel differently about EOS when, from when you started to now? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I absolutely do. You know, I, I think that I think that a lot of people are starting to feel a little differently because um, before we were building on Promise, and now we're building on EOS. So prior to the launch, all we had was uh, the discussions, the ideas, the theories, and philosophy behind the whole idea, uh, and now we're presented with these real-world 
problems in real world situations and uh, a business platform, which you have been, uh, first and foremost, is a decentralized application development platform, but it can be harnessed in incredibly effective and impactful ways. So I guess I've dialed that down, um, you know, we're going to, I still think this is going to change the world, but now I'm trying to remain very focused on user acquisition, user experience design, uh, cost of user acquisition, developer relations, things to make EOS the best positioned DAP platform for developers in the world. Okay, awesome. Now, um, our second panelist is Nathan Rempel from Team Generos, our lead developer and smart contract guru. Welcome. Thanks, Ty. So, I like your haircut and beard trim because you look like you did three months ago <laughs> when we started. How do you feel about EOS? Oh, EOS yeah, is great. There's, uh, you know, just trying to do everything possible. And I, I think there's a lot of a lot of space uh, that people can explore. Obviously, gaming's making a, a big, uh, big waves right now, just because of that transactional speed that uh, was promised, and so everybody's you know moving all their value into games and getting that high speed, transparent gaming. But we have our, uh, our uh, guest, our um, special guest, <laughs> uh, Syed from EOS Cafe. Welcome, Syed. Um, but I think people need to, you know, it's, it's all fun and games, spending money, making money with games. But now people are going to, what, what it does is it's showing that uh, there's real world applications. You can handle the transactional volumes. I was actually looking at EOS bets and they've already had 71 million transactions against their account. Uh, and that's since they launched a month ago. And how does that compare against any other blockchain? And that's one app. And that's, that's just rolling some dice. Now you scale that to any of the apps that you can make, whether it's on a, a financial side chain like Wordly or on the EOS mainnet. Um, and it's, all this stuff's just showing the potential. And uh, I was actually reading a study the other day someone sent me about uh, this sort of infrastructure cycle and people like whether you need the network or the apps. And the key is we need people making apps and the infrastructure is going to get better. The infrastructure gets better, and you can make better, better apps. And so, you know, I think everybody's just focused on how can we make it easier for people to make apps, and how can we make apps of our own and take advantage of that marketplace. Uh, so, welcome, Syed. What time is it uh, in Canada at the moment? Uh, it's all three a.m. <laughs> so, appreciate your time, and it's, I think it's four a.m. here. Yeah. So, thanks, guys. So we're just asking, how do you feel about EOS now? Uh, it's it's four, about four months since the mainnet launch. Do you feel differently from when you started? Um, yeah, I mean, um, even before we started, we were going through Dawn, uh, like Dawn 2, well, Dawn 3, Dawn 4 iterations. Um, smart contracts were updating continuously. And now, I mean, we, we still get these up, upgrades. Um, like even switching from EOS JS to EOS JS two, so what, like things are still breaking all the time, and you have to be uh, conscious of that. But things are much more stable now. You can actually build these applications which run for months at a time instead of having to uh, change your syntax every week. Okay, so um, we've had uh, the EOS hackathon in Sydney. Uh, some of us went to that and the EOS Hackathon in London. Some, some of us were lucky enough to go to both. So, um, I went to both, yeah. <laughs> you went to both. Well, I, I tell, I'll tell you what, what's most exciting about the EOS Hackathon in Sydney? How, did anyone get down to that from here? There's another, no sh another show of hands. Four folks. I think there was 400 in London and maybe 220 or so in Sydney. The most exciting thing there is seeing the passion for building applications that people want to use. You know, to, to Kevin's point around focusing on UI and UX, there's so, I shit you not, there's probably about 150, 200 ideas within this room. And it's about how do, how do we actually build them, who can build them? Um, and what the hackathons have demonstrated is there's enough very capable blockchain developers who are very proficient in building on EOSIO, and the ideas that are coming out are phenomenal. 
they just need a little bit of finessing when it comes to how do we actually talk about it to everyday people? You know, like an app built on blockchain. No, you shouldn't say an app built on blockchain. You should actually just say it's an app. And it's actually going to improve your life by feature benefit, whether it's free transactions or X, Y, Z. And certainly what Warbly are looking at and working with a lot of the block producers, you know, in fact, these are three of our block producers as well here, Generios, you know, Sire, the, ca uh, the cafe guys in EOS New York. And our philosophy is about simplifying this for the end user. So, you know, I think that's something that is certainly on the, on the tips of tongues in the EOSIO community too, and that's where I think we are we are now, and the hackathons demonstrated that. Okay, great. And then Nathan, you were at both of them. What, what are your thoughts coming back from London? I, I think it's interesting the direction um, that Block One has been sort of leading uh, the, the different hackathons through. For example, in Australia, it was very uh, environmentally focused, and then in London, it was very uh, security focused, and how. Uh, the blockchain technology, the underlying technology, can make a lot of that um, possible or better. Uh, one of the examples uh, from the London Hackathon was, of course, um, oh, the, the, the name eludes me, that uh, financial Chestnut. processor score. Chestnut. Yeah, Chestnut? Yeah, what's, what's your name? Second? Maybe, yeah. What's Equifax. Sure, sure. Equifax. Equifax had a huge data hack. And Two years ago. Again. <laughs> and so technologies uh, like blockchain, and as you said, um, you know, you want the UI to, so people don't realize they're using blockchain, because for a lot of people that's still scary, and I'm sure everybody in this world is very comfortable and familiar with blockchain, but for a lot of everybody not in this room, it's, it's a scary idea. So making all the potential from blockchain available to people without them knowing it's blockchain has been what a lot of these hackathons have been about. And uh, the, the people coming to these spaces and putting uh, good products together and doing that well has been uh, really exciting to see. So, uh, Kevin, what's uh, EOS New York been working on? Uh, well, I think one of the most important things we should probably work on is to prioritize what we're working on because there's <laughs> not much going on. And it's probably the same for, for everybody here. Uh, a couple of cool things that have been taking up a lot of our time. Uh, if anyone in the room is familiar, uh, there's been a lot of work with dispute resolution on EOS. You may have heard of ECAF or arbitration. Uh, if you haven't, dispute resolution is a is kind of a, a, a pivotal component of transactional confidence in business. So if you are a business person, right now blockchain is very much the Wild West. Uh, and we're, we're working uh, Actually, um, today, I guess it's today. So later today, I'll be going into Manhattan, I'll be meeting with a bunch of uh, dispute resolution uh, vendors from around the world to start to uh, see if they will come and make their services available on EOS for businesses to be able to select them as a dispute resolution vendor should they need it for contracts or e-commerce platforms or disputes over uh, non-fungible tokens for gaming or something. Uh, so really building this from the ground up. Uh, another fun thing is we're, we're really focused on uh, resource management. So if you're familiar with the way the EOS token works, it actually affords you resources on the network in um, CPU uh, networking and RAM. Uh, and so we're going to be releasing a tool that just tells you, uh, you have this many EOS, well here's what you can do on the network with it. Uh, and as, as a user, if you're playing um, dice, we were just talking about it before, how many times can you roll the dice uh, until, you, until you run out of resources? So just a tool that does that. Uh, and then finally, just rapid fire. Uh, we're building a hardware wallet because the ledger isn't great uh, and EOS needs something better. So uh, so that's what we're doing. We're hoping to release that in January, uh, sell that across the world and, and make the user experience so of interacting with these dApps. Have you started designing that wallet yet? The, the hardware wallet? Have you started working on that? The, the design of the wallet? Oh yes, have, have I been on mute the entire time? No. No, no. no we <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the hardware wall is finished. Um, we, we built it, we tested it, it works. 
we are now in the mass production phase, so we're working on uh, building out the components, uh, and I'm pretty sure some of the people uh, here will be getting some tests, um, some prototypes to, to break, so we'll be in touch as well. And, and Kevin, if, if I can ask, what's wrong, or what do you see as the challenges with the, with the ledger? Obviously it's not natively integrated, or it's not as simple as BTC, Ethereum, and what have you. Yeah, um, the, um, our, our technical team would probably have better answers for you, but uh, unless it's changed in the past couple of days, uh, right now I don't I don't believe that the ledger can move DAP tokens or, or anything based yeah, on. Yeah, I can I can answer that. So um, Go ahead, yeah, so so I mean we we've, we've integrated uh, ledger into our blocks.io um, wallet. And the, the main issue with the ledger is that there's only there's only certain actions that it supports. So you have a transfer that it supports. You have um, around half of the main EOS functions. So buying RAM, selling RAM, staking, unstaking. But there there's some big functions that it currently doesn't support. For example, updating your auth. So if you actually set your owner key to the ledger right now, there's no way for you to change it back because the ledger simply can't sign it. And the way it works is that they've, they've hard-coded the ABIs into the EOS app. Um, there are ways for them to sign it, sign like a transaction app, um, a transaction like arbitrarily, but ledger, like ledger itself has um, told the creator crypto fairy to not do that for now. There are discussions to do that with like warnings, um, so the user would see um, can can cannot parse the transaction. Because right now, when you put a transaction on on the ledger, it shows exactly what it's doing, like transferring ten EOS to uh, Kevin. But with like an arbitrary hash like that, um, since you can't store every one of their APIs and keep them updated on the EOS app, um, you would be signing like an arbitrary hash. And doing that is a lot of times unsafe, and that's why it was blocked in the initial implementation. But what that also does is that prevents people from playing you know, um, EOS Knights other, and using other dApps that may not be using something as simple as a transfer function. Um, so that, that's something that uh, would be solved by other hardware wallets, such as the, um, the Scattered Liquid EOS hardware wallet, or the one that US New York is coming up with. And, and I, I want to uh, kind of summarize what you just said, because the, the reason why that there's a problem, uh, simply for me, is that you're painfully aware that you're using it when you're using it. Uh, and that's kind of by design, because you're supposed to feel like there are these obstacles, that it's very safe. Uh, but when you're when you have these custom permissions that you can set up with Neo so that you can interact with games with the, uh, you know using a low risk permission that has been set up, uh, you need to be as far removed uh, from that awareness as possible. What was mentioned in the beginning, uh, we want to make it so that you don't even know you're using a blockchain. That's that's when you know that we've won, so to speak. Can we uh, get a demo, Kevin? Do you have one, Sprinkle? Oh no, it's actually at uh, our, our lead blockchain engineer's house um, work. He, he, has, he has all of them right now. Can we have a screen grab? <laughs> all, all secret still. Uh, we're doing the, the product design, oh. branding, building the website, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Soon. Don't worry, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mail y'all. Oh, oh, right. So it's very interesting you, you're talking about the design, um, the design of it being very conscious around it's a very difficult process and we were having a barbecue on the weekend and we were saying whereas the Chinese the way they develop is around making it as simple as possible and taking all those roadblocks out does um who wants to um address that question uh like a like a uh, uh, Chinese hard wallet or hardware wallet no I think I think the uh the issue we found is that there's actually a, a lot of um Chinese marketed uh, mobile wallets that don't interface with other um, sort of security providers. 
So, so the big thing that came out of that discussion was that uh, the Western world seems to be mostly security focused. A lot of people are very familiar with Bitcoin. They want their, their Bitcoin to feel safe. Whereas uh, the Eastern market seems to be really targeting that user friendliness, um, but maybe at the expense of some safety considerations, at least, at least for the majority of, of users um, that, that people have seen there's, there's less care about, oh, I'm only going to use Cleos because I want to manage my keys. And other people are like, oh, I'm just going to throw my private key into this app. I'm going to use it. It's really easy. I get tokens every time I push a button. Um, and so what's sort of the nice middle ground where you have that good user experience that keeps people using your app, but also that safety? And especially with like things like hardware wallets, how do you even tie those into mobile apps? And then, you know, sort of where where do we go with uh, mobile security? Oh, I think I think a lot of that uh, has to do with more of a software question uh, than a hardware question. But the, the one one of the just one, another one of the difficulties that I've seen with uh, the um, harbor wallets that are available with EOS is that a lot of people are figuring out very quickly that um, s selling, building, or exporting any type of cryptographic good it usually runs afoul with state legislation, uh, federal code, or whatever. I mean, we, we, we're, we're having to explore that right now. I know that there was a uh, <clears throat> there was a Western. Uh, Lock producer that was supposed to act as an authorized reseller for a Chinese hardware wallet, they can't because they because legally it's so difficult. So I know that there's just a distribution issue there as well. Uh, but the 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 thing that we like about what we're building is when you plug it in, your computer knows why it's there. It's there to do one thing. Uh, but the interesting thing that you that you touched on is this spectrum of security because. You just just like um, with decentralization being a spectrum, and you have trade-offs whichever way that you go, uh, you you're you're going to have to say, do I want Fort Knox? Do I want this like bank safe, or do I want uh, something that is super easy to use with low barrier? Uh, so there's a middle ground there. Um, sorry, am I am I good? Yeah, you're good. Uh, we just. Oh, okay. I'm just adjusting so these guys can see me. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 finding that middle ground. That the hardware wall we're building is not going to be for. Uh, you know, if you have ten thousand EOS, figure out a security solution. Don't use our hardware wall. If you want to uh, use and engage with the EOS blockchain, use our hardware wall. Sorry, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so I mean, I have, I have a question for uh, Kevin. So what's the difference between, um, if, if you say the point, the point of this hardware wallet is not security, then what is the point, or what is the difference between using this hardware wallet and using Scatter? Well, no, the, the, the point of the hardware wallet, uh, the point of the hardware wallet is certainly security. It's just, it's not going to be the most secure option available. Because to do that, you would have to trade off the usability and convenience of being able to seamlessly engage with many of the DAPs on these Right. So, so, so you're, cre you're creating that middle ground that you talked about earlier between security and usability. You're creating, essentially, US New York is creating the first usable uh, hardware wallet for, uh, for DAPs. So it sounds like that, and I think the, the cherry on the cake would be if we could then ensure that wallet and ensure the contents on that wallet. That's certainly what Warbly uh, are looking to do, is to provide users with assurances that their coins can be safe, whether they get sold or whether they get lost. Hey, you can insure your car, you can insure your bloody laptop, so why can't we ensure uh, value that we have stored on a hardware wallet, which is kept in a safe in a house? There will be businesses that can assess that risk and provide services and you know to Kevin's point it's a compromise if we can compromise security but then ensure the risk I think that would be pretty cool for, for everybody. 
Uh, Generios is announcing our super safe hardware wallet, a three ton fireproof safe with a titanium engraver inside to put your private key. Jacob, you bet. What's the recommended retail price on that? Uh, it'll be at I'm, not, least... I'm, not, I'm not sure if um, I'm not sure if software related things can be insured though. Um, I mean, it, it, it depends who's it depends who's insured. Your money itself could be insured, but uh, a hardware wallet, um, you you could get it insured against like physical uh, stealing. You pay enough to get anything insured. No. But, I, I mean, how how would it work if um, if if simply someone there's a there's a virus on your computer which acts into the uh, hardware wallet? There's, you have like it exposes a vulnerability in your hardware wallet software. Because there's always software which uh, bridges your uh, computer to your hardware wallet. Sure. There's there's the way the way you would look at it is assessing assessing risk. Um, the same could be said about British Airways and their, their data breach a few weeks ago in the UK. They're up for a billion dollar, sorry, billion pound fine for, for GDPR data breach. There's companies that insure businesses for, for, for anything. Certainly when it comes to computer, when it comes to software, um, it's just finding the the business and the insurance underwriter. If we know what the what the numbers are, maybe there'll be limitations around the, the maximum amount of coins that can be insured. That's that's coming in the short term. I guess that's what I was getting into here. So yeah, I see that's a super test at the moment. Well, Joe. Sorry, sorry, hard to hear you. He said he sees it as a super test net. The EOS to go test and don't, don't underestimate the power of a, of a network and first mover advantage because uh, if anyone is worried, if they're hearing this and they're going, oh, well, what, what about the value of the token? Uh, when, when, when we are in a place where we have reliable, consistent inter-blockchain communication, uh, if, I, I'm imagining this kind of hub and spoke system where uh, these connections will need to be maintained, built and maintained by individuals between chains. It's not something that just works automatically. Uh, and EOS will be likely, the, the EOS public blockchain will be the largest, most active one of all of them. So the same way that Bitcoin runs its power over the entire blockchain space by being the base trading pair, or um, you know, oil is, it, actually I don't even know if it primarily is anywhere I know it's moving away, but oil is, is traded in the US dollars. You have all of the EOS IO IBC space base traded in EOS. That's that's a hugely valuable thing. Uh, so there's, it, it, don't think that it's a super test net and, you know, the token's not worth it. It's not true. I just wanted to iterate that whole idea that adoption by games is a huge importance for any blockchain in general is that one of the announcements we got at um, EOS Sydney Hackathon was that the, the designer of Second Life is actually getting a, a, a mind my, my, my words, but a crap ton of money of Block One to develop uh, a new Second Life or the next iteration of Second Life where you can have tradable assets in a game but it's based on EOS. So, yeah. 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 Well, it's fun, fun, uh, from my understanding, funded by Galaxy out of Mike Longbrex's uh, Galaxy Digital, uh, which is one of the VC firm, VC partners of EOS. Um, they did a live they are, they, are they are ready to deploy capital. Yeah. They yeah, so the, so, so the game is called High Fidelity. Um, which is developed by the, as I said, the uh, ex-founder, creator of um, Second Life. The, I mean, for people wondering how that works, the game itself isn't like, every time you move in the game, it's not like a transaction goes off in here. <laughs> um, the game itself is still run on centralized servers. Um, well, not necessarily centralized servers, it's, it's built more like Minecraft where people can run their own servers. Um, but the assets themselves are meant to be tracked on the blockchain. Um, so anything you put on the blockchain or the currency, they have their own uh, HLF tokens, I believe, um, 
which are which are tracked through the blockchain. It still hasn't been disclosed whether they're going to use mainnet or their own private chain, something like Blacks.io. Um, but um, this was even before Galaxy invested, there were already investors that had invested in the project. The game was almost running at that point. Um, it was it was pretty much a complete product in which they now integrated EOS for assets, which is in my opinion, for gaming, when you see something like a first-person shooter, you would see the assets. If you play something like Fortnite, you might see V-Bucks or skins or whatever on the chain, but the actual gameplay would still be um, somewhat central. I suppose just closing note on mass adoption, and it's a discussion I had the other day, is mass adoption for who? You know, back kind of to Kevin's point, we've got if, if we actually break down the amount of stakeholders in the world who could benefit from blockchain technology, we've got a room full of them here. Um, but then we have end users, and you could break end users down into about 20, 30 different categories. And we've got small business, medium business, enterprise. Um, and it's, it's a tough one, but you just got to look at the, let's just say the incumbent. What are they using before? And can blockchain provide a better solution, a faster solution, a more um, lower barrier to entry? free transactions or lower fees. It, it's very hard and it's an interesting topic just because there's so many intricacies and, intricacies and nuances. Uh, but mass adoption is coming, I think it's, my, my opinion, 12 to 24 months away. They're just right apps. Um, they, need, they need to be developed and, and deployed. In what, in, in what industry? Um, gaming is, 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 is immediate and I think the, uh, the money transfer, transfer remittance? Tra trans oh, absolutely. Remittance transfer is, is huge. A, 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 one, one story of remittance transfer is, is in the Middle East. Um, they've got two, three million ex expat workers in the Middle East who all, get paid on in, who all get paid on the same day. And these expat workers, let's just say they earn $100, they will send back 80% of that to their home countries. And they're not just sending it back in one transaction, they're sending it back in about 15 or 20 transactions to aunts, daughters, cousins, parents, and at the moment, the, the foreign exchange rates, if they were to do it via their online bank, it's got about 3.8% interest, interest rate or, or fee. If they walk on down to Western Union or one of, the, one of the stores, they got a queue for three hours, and they get about 1.5% discount, or it's, you know, 3%. That is it. People, if you look at what they do to save one one point five percent, what will they do to to pay zero point two percent? And that's what we've got to look at: ease of use. Everyone, like the majority of the world, own a mobile phone. Not everyone owns a house, and a mobile phone is is certainly it, there's there's a bottleneck at the moment. It comes down to good apps with good user interface and those that can meet certain regulations and legislations. So I think payments is certainly one if it can be mastered. Where, where is EOS fitting in there? Have they got an app for that? Where is the app for that? <laughs> <laughs> so Wobbly is a financial chain uh, based on EOS. I think there's a there's a number of uh, remittance providers um, or like remittance apps and money transfer apps that are uh, looking to leverage um, EOS as one of their mechanisms to do that. Uh, the, the big challenge most of them are facing is the, the fiat, fiat on ramps. You need to have, you get, need to get the fiat onto a blockchain, regardless of which sort of blockchain it is. And so uh, the, the big challenge, EOS is free, it has high transactional volume, so that's very attractive. But uh, a lot of exchanges and liquid providers, um, it doesn't have the same long history as some of the older currencies. So, so that's sort of the, the roadblock roadblock for some of those. And once those on-ramps are improved as well, it's going to explode. Okay, we'll end on that note there. Um, so we'll move into the networking and drinks uh, format, but I'd like to thank our friends uh, Kevin from New York and Syed from EOS Cafe. And um, so you can find these guys on Telegram, they're very active there. And um, yeah, thanks to Sam from Warbly, uh, helping us uh, buy the drinks. And, uh, and Nathan. So um, we hope to see you again in another month where Harry will uh, take you through smart contracts. So thanks guys, and uh, we'll see you at the bar. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.